So continuing along, looking at anatomy with respect to motion, making motion the central part of our network of meaning or our semantic network, we're looking at wrist flexion. Our main objectives, a specific discussion of what wrist flexion is, so the planes and axes, very general discussion of the muscles that flex the wrist, very general discussion of the nerves that supply those muscles, very gen general discussion of the vascular supply, general discussion of the areas to assess and treat should rest flexion issues be suspected or, or by the practitioner or reported by the patient. So quick overview again, which is quite redundant on purpose of planes. The sagittal plane is a 50% cut of the body left to right. Horizontal or transverse plane is 50% cut of the body top to bottom. The frontal plane or the coronal plane is a 50% cut of the body back to front. Axes are perpendicular to planes, sagittal plane, horizontal or transverse axis, horizontal plane or transverse plane, vertical axis, frontal plane or coronal plane, AP or PA axis. In this case, in the anatomical position, with the hands at the side and the palms facing up and the thumbs facing out, wrist flexion is movement of the palms towards the front of the body. Now that motion when the hands are at the side is occurring in the sagittal plane on a transverse axis or a horizontal axis. Now, the majority of that motion is the carpals in relation to the ulna, the, or no, sorry, the, I may be messing that up. It may be the carpals in relation to the radius. Uh, the, so I may be may, messing something up there, but it's going to be one or the other, the radius or the ulna, the radius generally being larger at the inferior aspect. I believe it may be the radius. So I might've made a mistake there. Please excuse me and look it up. And when I make mistakes while I'm going, it's actually quite useful because then it generates the impetus for you to go and look and make sure whether or not I did make a mistake or I'm mistaken about my mistake. Either way, wrist flexion is movement of the palm towards the front of the body in the sagittal plane on a transverse axis. The muscles that are going to do this, there are some ways in which you can parse the muscles of the anterior compartment of the forearm to help you with this. So you're going, if it has carpi instead of metacarpi, because you've got uh, uh, flexor radialis uh, carpi and flexor ulnaris carpi, I believe. I may be mistaken on that one, but if it's got carpi in it instead of metacarpi, it's going to flex the wrist. If it's got uh, longus in it, so palmaris longus or flexor, dig flexor digitorum longus or flexor pollicis longus, it's going to flex the wrist as opposed to palmaris brevis, pol uh, flexor pollicis brevis or flexor digitorum brevis. Right, so the brevis, generally is speaking, is closer to the hand and is not going to do much to flexion of the wrist. And then the that should be about it. Right, so you've got a few that are going to flex. So if it's carpi instead of metacarpi, it's going to flex the wrist. If it is uh, longus instead of brevis, it's going to be a part of flexing the wrist, especially when you're looking at muscles that are in the anterior compartment of the forearm, right? And all of those are visible here. Getting into them specifically, picking them apart is less useful for this particular project on account of the fact that what we're really aiming at is giving you a general overview of where, what to consider, where to look with respect to treatment, right? So you're not going to be able to pick apart the muscles of the anterior forearm, regardless of which level, the superficial, the intermediate, or the deep. In there, you're not going to be able to pick them apart. You're working from the outside. So you've just got a chunk of muscles. So generally speaking, you work on the chunk of muscles. You're not going to work on the specific one, such that going really deep into these particular details is less useful for this project. Now the neurovascular bundle, you're looking at circulation coming off of the brachial artery as it splits into the radial and ulnar arteries, which then has the radial recurrent artery, as well as the anterior and posterior interosseous. We're going to be much more interested in the anterior interosseous for anything with respect to wrist flexion on account of the fact that the muscles that flex the wrist are on the, on the anterior side. Therefore, some of them will receive some blood supply from the anterior interosseous, the radial or ulnar arteries, depending on which muscle you're talking about. But the access point for the osteopathic practitioner is this anterior anterior portion or anterior surface of the forearm. You don't get to the specific arteries. You get to the general area that has the ability to put mechanical pressure on the, these arteries. Then you're also here looking at the 
uh, median nerve, the ulnar nerve, as well as the uh, interosseous arteries, so the anterior interosseous nerve in this case, depending on the particular muscle that you're looking at. But again, this is your access point. You're not picking these structures apart. You just have that anterior surface of the forearm as your point of attention with respect to how the soft tissues are moving and whether or not they may be putting pressure on the neurovascular contents here. Now, as far as areas of consideration for assessment and treatment, as we've already noted, the anterior surface of the forearm is important, not only for the muscles that are going to generate wrist flexion, but also for the neurovascular bundle. But to get a little larger, anytime you're dealing with the arm, you've got to consider the cervical column. So not only for the brachial plexus, but also for the subclavian artery uh, passing between the anterior and middle scalenes, right? So you have to consider the upper, upper ribs to some degree here, but you've got to consider the neck for the neurovascular bundle. You've got to consider the clavicle as both the subclavian artery, the subclavian vein, as well as the brachial plexus are going to pass posterior to the clavicle through the axilla. So you're considering the axilla as part of the neurovascular bundle here. Then what you're also considering subsequent to that is the anterior soft tissues of the arm. So the brachial plexus as the brachial plexus and the brachial artery descend in relation to the biceps. So you're looking at the anterior surface of the arm. Then you're going to look at the anterior soft tissues of the forearm, as we already noted with respect to the neurovascular bundle and the muscles that are going to generate wrist flexion. Now your red flags or uh, contraindications are going to be consistent. So essentially once you're away from the neck, particularly, or absolutely needing to check treat the neck instead of checking the neck, then your contraindications and red flags get a little bit smaller. So a known fracture or a known tear anywhere in that region, you don't treat the fracture or the tear because you could worsen it through movement or you could aggravate it. So you're going to be very careful there. A suspected fracture or tear, you're going to refer out for confirmation from another healthcare practitioner because if there is a tear or if there is a fracture, you don't want to aggravate it. In both cases, you can treat the patient, but you don't necessarily want to treat the area. So if you have confirmation that there is a fracture or a tear, don't treat the area of the fracture or tear. If you suspect a fracture or tear and you do not get confirmation of that, you actually get uh, information that says it's not there, then you're safer to treat very cautiously in that region. But if you suspect a fracture or tear, you refer that out for confirmation or uh, for differential diagnosis as to what else it might be.